Good evening, everyone. Kalispera uh, Welcome to another session of the Greek Community of Melbourne's um, Greek History and Culture Public Sort of Seminar Series. Um, just a few household items before we, uh, we proceed with um, tonight's um, seminar. Um, next week's seminar, um, that's on the 22nd of April, uh, will be by um, Professor Margaret Cameron from the University of Melbourne, the topic being practicing toward virtue or why it shouldn't hurt to be good. Um, it's um, a topic around antiquity. It will be a hybrid seminar. So from next week onwards, we are returning to the mezzanine level of the Greek Centre. So you're more than welcome to come by and uh, follow the presentation in person. At the same time, simultaneously, we will be broadcasting it to our friends who have registered on on Facebook, on YouTube. So from next week onwards, uh, we return to the uh, mezzanine level of the Greek Centre and the seminars uh, will have a hybrid format, both live the mezzanine level and also simult simultaneously uh, broadcast. Um, another event that you should be aware of, on Friday, the 23rd of April, 7pm, uh, uh, there will be a poetry recital of uh, Dionysius Olamos's famous poem, The Free Besieged, Electric Yokomeni. Um, Professor Brasidis Carlis from the University of Sydney uh, is coming down to the event. Um, he will be um, reciting that poem in, uh, in Greek, while Dr. Tina Yanuko uh, will do the English translation. Uh, there will be um, food and drinks available as well. Uh, there's limited capacity at the mezzanine level, so please book your um, sp uh, spot online. We also will be simultaneously um, broadcasting that as well. So uh, 22nd with uh, Professor Cameron, that's Thursday, and 23rd on Friday, um, Friday evening with Professor Vrasidas Karalis and Dina Yanukos, uh, the poetry recital of Dionysus and also the free besieged. Um, I also like to thank Velos Lawyers, were the sponsors of tonight's seminars. Okay, let's move to um, tonight's topic. Um, the 1821 uh, Greek Revolution or the 1821 War of Independence was, in, was a multifaceted affair. And yes, it unavoidably had many dimensions. Yes, it culminated from a series of local uprisings, but there were countless failed uprising, uprisings in the past. What made this one different is that it had both the right momentum and it was also complemented by favourable developments um, elsewhere. The diaspora played a key role. It provided organisational skills. It provided much needed material assistance. In modern day terms, it was also the public relations vehicle for the new aspiring Greek state. The Greek diaspora spread both the nationalist, spread both nationalist and emancipatory discourse inspired by the Enlightenment ideas emanating from both the French and American revolutions. The 1821 revolution attracted Philippines from all walks of life who were stimulated to action, uh, enamored by the heritage of Greek antiquity. The Ottoman Empire um, was also wrestling with its own internal struggles and challenges, and not, to, and not at the peak of its powers uh, and influence. It was, but it was still able to mount a considerable defence. Our speaker tonight will examine all these issues and more around the, uh, the Greek Revolution and the War of Independence. Um, let's move to our speaker, uh, Professor Thanos Veremis. It's with great pleasure that I'm able to introduce tonight's speaker. Although it's midday by his standards in Greece, um, Κύριε Βερέμι, καλησπέρα σα. Από την Ελληνική Κοινότητα Μελβούνη, μεγάλη τιμή να σε έχουμε μαζί μα. Και για μένα. A bit of background um, on um, Athens born Professor Βερέμι. He's a professor emeritus of political history at the University of Athens, uh, the Department of European International Studies, and a founding member of the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, Elia, the acronym being Elia MEP. He studied political science at the University of Boston and history at Oxford University. During his illustrious career, he has held numerous positions. He's been a visiting scholar at Harvard, Princeton, and Oxford, while also having teaching positions over the years, the University of Athens, 
University of Cyprus, the London School of Economics, and the University of Illinois in Chicago. He's the author of 20 acad academic monographs, and his areas of research interest include Greek and Balkan history and politics, and nationalism and identity formation in Southeastern Europe. Uh, enough for me, I'll pass the baton on uh, our speaker tonight, Professor Danos Veremis. Kiri Verem? Kiri Tala, as we said. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I, I would very much like to thank Mr. Dallas for inviting me, uh, for inviting me to speak to you, and you are my imagined uh, community. I don't know if you've come across a very important uh, English uh, political scientist. His name is Benedict Anderson. He is the most uh, recent uh, um, author to deal with nationalism and the nation state. And what he says, which is very interesting and important in what we have to say tonight, is that uh, the nation as a concept is an abstraction. It's not something we see, we hear, we know. I've seen Mr. Dallas tonight, and that's my first time, but that's the extent of it. The rest I must imagine. I must imagine you, all of you who are listening to me now, as a nation of uh, Greeks of fellow Greeks. Why? Because you share certain cultural uh, characteristics with me. Um, probably the most important is language. Uh, I, not, I don't know how well you've been tutored to the Greek language, but it's a language which has been around for thousands of years and has not changed to the extent of not being able to read, to understand for a modern Greek, what was translated second century before Christ. In other words, the uh, Old Testament, which was translated by 70 Hellenized Jews of Alexandria, is very intelligible. Today, any person with some Greek uh, education can understand, if he goes to church, what the Old Testament of our church today is about which is all in Greek, not to mention the, uh, the, the, the evangelists, the, the, the uh, Mark, uh, uh, John, uh, Matthew, and uh, um, Luke, uh, who ha wrote three of the, of the four of the evangelists, evangelistes, wrote their testaments about the life and works of uh, Jesus Christ in Greek. Uh, not too many people know about this. I was telling this to some American friends and they had no idea. They said, really, we thought it was in Latin. I said, no, no, Latin was not that well known yet. It became later on when the Roman Empire took over most of the um, Middle East or the Near East, as we call it today. But uh, before that, Greek was the prevalent language. Before Islam came to being, it was Alexander the Great who spread the Greek language, Alexandrini Koini, as they say, in, in, in uh, Erasmian pronunciation. You know, Erasmus pronounced uh, all the diphthongs, to the diphthongs uh, with two sounds, not one as we do today. So kini, which is Omicron Yota, we call it kini. They, they, they Erasmus, uh, pronounced it koini. So it's Alexandrini koini. Uh, that language, uh, of course, was, was Greek. It was spread by Alexander the Great. I must tell you at this point, we're a bit off the track, but it doesn't matter. This is what university people are about. To, tr to put you off the track now and then. Uh, the Macedonian dialect of Greek is a Doric dialect. It's like Spartan Greek. Uh, in other words, for, by Greek standards of antiquity, the most important, the most cultured, the most prevalent, let's say, dialect was the Ionian Athenian dialect. All the great works, Plato, Aristotle, uh, you name it, were written mostly in that dialect. 
So the Macedonians were something of Horiates by today's peasants, so to speak. So they used, they used the Doric dialect, uh, Itani Epitas, if you might have heard the, the, the uh, words of, of the Spartans when they fought in Thermopylae. They said uh, Itan, their mother would give them their shield which was impossible to, 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 to carry, very, very uh, uh, sort of uh, heavy, heavy stuff. Um, and she would tell them, either bring this back with you, which means that you have not run away from battle, or may they bring you on it. In other words, dead. Those were mothers of all times, very tough women. So, uh, Itan, in Athenian Greek, it would be tin, iepitis, ita, in both cases. Uh, the Macedonians would say itam iepitas. Now, this Alexander and Philip decided to change because they said, look, now we're a great power. We don't have to speak this uh, uh, peasant dialect. Uh, let's speak the real Makoi, which is Athenian Greek. And this is where Athenian comes into the Macedonian uh, dialect. And it becomes the prevalent language. So what Alexander the Great spread throughout the Middle East was an Athenian koini, kini, the ordinary Athenian dialect. And this is what we have today in the, in the testaments, in, in, in the translation of the uh, Bible, of the Old Testament, and so forth. I'm saying all this just to tell you that the Greek language has a, an incredible continuity in time. Uh, consider uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare, we understand, most people who know English understand Shakespeare. But can you understand Chaucer? You cannot, at least I can't. I mean, it's just another language. It's a foreign language to me. And he's what? He's 100 years before Shakespeare, nothing. I'm talking about two centuries, 200 years before Christ. And that is a language which is understood today by modern Greeks in church. So to come back to what uh, makes us Greek, at least according to the original uh, 1821 Greeks, it was mostly a question of religion, uh, Greek Orthodox in other words, and the knowledge of the language of the church, which was Greek, uh, the Greek language of the translation of the Testaments. And no person who went to church was allowed not to understand what the priest would say in Greek, which made most Christian, Orthodox Christians, Greek speaking. So there's a combination of these two elements into our uh, identity. And uh, here comes this very important political scientist, Benedict Anderson, who tells us that pre-modern societies, which were segmented in pieces, small pieces, mainly based on the family factor, clans, in other words, you were such and such and belonged to the clan of such and such. You were not a Greek in the sense that we are today. You are in Australia and I'm in Athens and we have something in common. We feel we have a common identity to share. Not so then. Uh, there was a, of course, there was an, a Greek identity, but it was still in the making. What was for sure is that these people shared an identity of religion and I, an identity of language through religion. It's not that they knew Plato or Aristotle, they did not. But they knew uh, Luke's and Mark's testament, uh, Evangelia. That they certainly should know. And this is what make them, made them Greeks. And in time, this is what made Greeks all of the other um, Orthodox Christians who participated in the Greek War of Independence, be they Serbs, Bulgarians, uh, Montenegrins, and Albanians. Greece was full of Arvanites, Albanians who had come to Greece 
not as conquerors, but as seekers of land to cultivate. And this began in the 14th century when Byzantium was still alive. These people came to Greece from Albania to make a better living and slowly they were integrated into the system. And today, no one really knows because the Peloponnese, for instance, was full of uh, Albanian immigrants. Uh, and the same is true for, for uh, Athens and its environs. Yatiki Attica was full of Albanians. When Otto King Otto came to Greece and heard the strange language spoken in Plaka somewhere, and he said, ah, this is ancient Greek. And somebody said, no, no, it's, it's ancient Albanian. So there you are. And the Albanians were slowly taken, bring, brought into the Greek uh, community. And so many leaders of the War of Independence, Miaoulis, uh, the islands of Idra and Spetses, mostly Albanian um, communities. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, uh, Attica, uh, and some of uh, uh, Suliotis. Suliotis were Christian Albanians, Marcos Boceris and Kitsos Zavelas and all these people who uh, became part of the Greek uh, scene and heroes of the Greek War of Independence. So this is how identity is built. And we must realize that this segmented, as Benedict Anderson would put it, society, community, of people who felt that uh, they were Christian Orthodox, no doubt, uh, but they also had a, a local identity if they came from uh, Tripoli, uh, Arcadia, or from uh, Mesolongi, Rumeli. So they had their own identity, which was a local identity. Now, since I mentioned Mesolongi, the siege of Mesolongi, the free besieged, as Solomos would say, ah, here's another non-Greek speaker in his uh, in the beginning. You know, Dionysius Solomos, who is the uh, national poet uh, uh, and has written the um, words of the Greek anthem, was born into uh, an aristocratic family, but he was a he was a uh, born out of wedlock. His mother was a uh, worked in the household of uh, um, Count uh, Salamone, an Italian name, of course. Solomos comes from Salamone, from the fish, you know, and that was a, the, the, the um, symbol of the family. The, the uh, crest of the family it was a sol Solomon or several, I'm not sure. Uh, so his first language was Italian. And he was brought into Greek by various Greeks of the uh, Seven Islands. Um, Tercetis is a very important figure in Solomos' life because he, he told him, he said, you are a great poet, but Italy has many great poets. Uh, Greece needs great poets. You have to turn into a Greek. You have to write poetry into Greek. And, Solomos became enthralled by the prospect of becoming a Greek and began to write poems in Greek, which are absolutely amazing poets, wonderful poets in demotic Greek. He followed the local kind of what he heard as a child and probably what his mother spoke because she was not a, a very educated uh, woman. She was a uh, helping hand in the household of her master. Uh, who recognized uh, Solomos as his son, and therefore he became uh, his heir uh, in the family. But I'm telling you all this just to tell you why Solomos was uh, taken by Mesolongi, because Mesolongi is one of the first cases where Greeks of all uh, uh, parts of Greece, Peloponnesians, Islanders, even people from Himara, which is part of Albania today, a man called Spiro Milos, a great uh, warlord of Himara, who wrote his memoirs of Mesolongi, very important memoirs, and fought during the war in Mesolongi, along with all these others, Kasumulis, who was a Macedonian, um, 
uh, there's no there's no end to how many Greeks fought in Mesolonghi and how many died in the Exodus uh, because they attempted this after after having been uh, completely uh, barred from from uh, outside help and from food stuff they ate practically anything they could lay their hands on and finally they decided to make uh, to make the exodus which is one third survived the exodus because the turks and the egyptians who were besieging mesolongi uh, had been uh, alerted to to the decision of the greeks to to make the exodus and this is probably the most important uh, by European terms, moment of the Greek War of Independence, 1825-1826, uh, a complete year, April 25, April 26, uh, is when the Greeks decided to make uh, the Exodus. And there we find very important names, which we know for various reasons, important uh, victims of this war, people who died during the Exodus, and we find the name Palamas, uh, the, another very important poet of Greece, uh, whose family background is from Mesolonghi. He was born in Patras, but he lived in Mesolonghi much of his time. Uh, so one of his pre, of his ancestors died in Mesolonghi, so we have the word, the, the, the name Palamas. We have the name uh, um, of, of an armatolos, a very important armatolos, Sturnaris, uh, who went into Mesolonghi when he was 53 years old, which is the equivalent now of 73 years old. He was an old man, in other words, or maybe 83, I don't know, today, of a person in, when he, of 53 in those days, which was very old, and fought and made an attempt to but he couldn't run very much because he was an old man. And he was killed also, an important name. There's a street after his name in Athens. And there are many others names, Tricupis, Tricupis, uh, a fo uh, an ancestor of Charilos Tricupis and Spiridon Tricupis, uh, who is a, a name from Mesolonghi. Tricupis was elected in Mesolonghi on many occasions. He was first elected as by the Manchester Greeks. Uh, in those days, and they're trying to do it again today, which would be a very good thing, Greeks of the diaspora, uh, if they registered, could vote. And Charilos Trikoupi is one of the greatest uh, Greek prime ministers and politicians in general, uh, was uh, elected on his first term by the Greeks of Manchester, uh, United Kingdom. So to go back to the famous dead from the Mesolonghi Exodus, uh, there are many, many names. Uh, we know uh, historical names. There are people from Suliotes who fought and died in Mesolonghi. Uh, Suliotes, by the way, were the best um, fighters the Greek forces could have. They were professional uh, warlords, they fought for a living, and they joined the Greek War of Independence because the definition of a Greek as opposed to a Turk was religion. If you were a Christian Orthodox, you belonged to the Greek side. You belonged to the Greek side. If you were a Muslim, uh, Albanian, then you belonged to the other to the enemy side, to the side of the enemy. Now, I'm telling you all this just to give you a perspective of what and how this society was transformed from the original pre-modernity of a segmented society into families, into local, uh, to the local identity as opposed to being from some other part of, of Greece of today. And then slowly, because of the mobility of this community, because of the fact that these people uh, had to change uh, habitat, they had to go elsewhere to fight, sometimes among themselves. The Greek uh, civil wars were not unknown 
to the war of independence. And this is another interesting uh, characteristic uh, of the war of independence is that the Greeks fought against each other. Why? Because they had different ideas as to who should be in charge of the war of independence and as to who should, uh, uh, should manage the entire uh, operation. So this brought the Greeks often against each other. But then again, which revolution did not have a civil war aspect into it? As I know, my history tells me that most wars of independence and revolutions, and you know, the Greek war of independence was both a war of independence and a revolution. Why? Because society changed during this war of independence and made it a revolution. In other words, Greece or the Greeks were a very different kind in terms of organization of societal organization before and after the war of independence. And the second phase is what we call modernity. And modernity is about the nation, the nation state, the birth of a nation state. Uh, this is today's, tonight's rather um, subject. And this is what we're discussing. Between 1821 and 1828, when Kapodistrias came to Greece, you might know who Kapodistrias is. Kapodistrias was a, a count from Corfu. He became, he was educated as a doctor because in those days, uh, the education of a doctor was the equivalent of the liberal arts, let's say, education. And then in time, he went to Russia. He was a Russophile and became no less the uh, foreign ministry of Tsar Alexander I. In other words, he fought, he was on the side of the Russians throughout the reign of uh, Alexander. He came at odds with Alexander at some point. Uh, he uh, resigned from office and went and lived in uh, Switzerland, where he was responsible for the um, constitution of the Swiss which is they still have. They still have and they're very knowledgeable uh, of Kapodistrias. They know of his presence and his work as the constructing their, their um, constitution. And in 1827, the Greeks made an attempt to bring Kapodistrias to Greece to act as the new head of the um, government. In other words, they call him Kivernitis in Greek, but governor doesn't mean what Kivernitis was about. Kivernitis is, is, is the equivalent, was the equivalent of a prime minister with some elements of head of state as well, because Greece did not have a king yet. Kapodistrius was out looking for a king and the Greek state was looking for a king. But in Kapodistrius' days, 18. 28 to 1831, um, he uh, became the prime minister and he did wonders. In a very small period of time, he was given a uh, the right to be in charge for seven years, no less. So he had both the power and the was given a, a mandate to do his work, his job in seven years. He did it in three because he was assassinated by the Maniots uh, who believed that he was a, an, an autocrat, that he was a very uh, bent on, on uh, destroying uh, local powers, which he was, and rightly so, because Greece uh, became a state or looked after the prototype of France in those days. France was a uh, uh, organized uh, uh, state on the basis of a single government and a single power. Uh, it was not a federation, in other words. It was a unitary state. It's the, not the equivalent of, uh, it's the equivalent of most states of today. 
um, Australia, I expect, or I'm not sure. Maybe it's maybe Australia is a, is a uh, you tell me that a federation. But from the European states, uh, the only federation I know of Germany, Germany is a federation of states because of its history of very different many states, and and Switzerland, which is a confederation, an even looser organization of states. So, but most of the others, France certainly is a unitary state, uh, Italy is a unitary state, Greece is a unitary state after uh, France. And this is what Capodistria did, made Greece into a modern unitary state, a nation state. What is it that makes a nation important as an element of a state? It's whereas the ancien regime the old regime before the French war, the French revolution uh, was uh, based on God's will to give king such and such or queen such and such to a country, um, which legitimized the state power. Uh, kingship legitimized the power of the state. After the war, the French uh, Revolution, it's the nation that will legitimize the state. And this is what is true for Greece, especially after Capodistria. Uh, the nation suddenly comes out of uh, the woodworks and becomes the most important legitimizing factor of the government of the state. The state exercises power. For power to be, uh, to be legal, uh, you need a legalizing factor. And this is the will of the nation. So here we are with a nation which is an old nation. It's not a new one. It's not born then. But it becomes part of the political system, much more so than it was before. So we, uh, in, during the War of Independence, in only eight or eight and a half, nine years, Greece is transformed from a uh, local identities, many identities, based on religion, mainly. Uh, the common denominator is religion. But then slowly the Greeks realize that they have other things in common. What we have in common today, you of Greek descent in Australia, we uh, in, in Greece, we feel a community, a sense of bondage, of bond rather, uh, of a communal bond, which was not the case in the distant past. And this is what makes us, according to Benedict Anderson, members of the same nation. Now, there are very different types of nations. There are nations which are, or at least they think they are, uh, pure in terms of bloodline, uh, such as France and Germany and uh, maybe Italy, and others which, such as the United States of America, a nation of Americans, uh, which is a nation of many different uh, uh, ethnicities. Uh, they are not all part of the same ethnicity, but they have cultural bonds that makes, make them Americans and their loyalty to their country. I expect the same is true for Canada and probably Australia, you tell me. Uh, a multi-ethnic uh, community, which however has common uh, bonds and makes, which makes these bonds make them into the nation they are. So to go back to the War of Independence, after Mesolonghi, uh, 1826, uh, the Greeks begin to create this bond between them. Not that it did not exist before, but it was weaker. They had no practical experience of what the other side, let's say, of the Corinthian Gulf, um, kept uh, from their attention. Uh, in other words, Greeks uh, on two sides of the Corinthian Gulf 
and Greeks in Crete, Greeks in the islands, uh, Greeks in the Ionian islands. Uh, were they always Greek? Some were, others were Hellenized. Uh, I was telling Mr. Dallas before, uh, I, I never understood how the Libro d'Oro, the Libro d'Oro in the Ionian islands is, is, is a book of local aristocracy, mostly Italian, of course, all Italian initially, and Catholic initially. And by the war of the time of the War of Independence, people like Solomos, who was a count, was Orthodox. Now, how did this transformation happen? That's something we need to figure out ourselves. Uh, there were many Cretans, of course, that went to the Ionian Islands after the fall of Crete to the Muslims, to the Ottomans. And these people were already Orthodox. They brought culture from, the, from Crete. Uh, we know that the Cretans had a superior linguistic tradition. Uh, people like Cornaros, Erotocritus, if you've heard of the play, um, which is amazing Greek, wonderful Greek, a uh, local kind of, not, not, uh, not uh, but uh, the demotic Greek, so to speak. Uh, these people bring their tradition to the Ionian Islands and we have a wonderful um, tradition of painting and, and language. And this is where people like Solomos come from and Tercetis, who, who was his mentor, and people like Calvus, uh, another amazing uh, Italianesque uh, writer of the 19th century, uh, an amazing writer. We know very little about him because at some point he disappeared, went to England, uh, became head of a school for boys in, in England, and died there, married an English woman, and we know less about him after he departed from uh, Zante. But Solomos we know much about because he lived in Greece, stayed in Greece. And we have his wonderful poetry, uh, which is really uh, probably worth revisiting. And this is my, um, my um, word to you, to revisit Solomos's poetry, wonderful poetry. Uh, he was taken, as I said, by the free besieged and wrote uh, a Siloyi uh, collection of poetry about the free besieged, where he tries to connect the um, uh, nature's rebirth with the rebirth of a nation, with the besieged who listen to the sounds of uh, spring that is upon them, and they have to live through their drama the way they do, and then finally they make the effort to, to, to uh, go out and save what they can. Uh, as I said, one third survived, two thirds died in the process, but Mesolonghi became a symbol. Uh, I doubt whether the uh, war, the, the naval war in Navarino would have occurred between the three great powers and the uh, com combined forces of uh, the Turkish Navy and the Egyptian Navy, where the latter were destroyed practically by the three powers. I doubt that this would have occurred if it had not been from, for Mesolonghi's uh, um, the fame throughout Europe and the free besieged, as, as uh, Solomos calls these people. Um, so the Greek War of Independence is a very mixed affair. It's an affair which is full of, as I said, blots of um, civil wars, uh, of great, um, of, of freedom fighting, on the part of many Greeks. And, and this is an important element. It's something which modern states do not have to the point that they had then. Uh, the true um, collection, a true collection 
of capable people, capable in the sense of war, where they had to fight a war, or even in political terms. There were many good politicians that came out of the Greek War of Independence, uh, mainly because they had studied abroad and they, had, they knew what the diaspora was about. They had, uh, for instance, the Philikieteria, the Society of Friends, which spread the good word of the revolution throughout Greece, they were mostly uh, um, uh, people in commerce, uh, business people, who were lived in uh, Russia mainly, close to Greece at the time, or Odysseus. Uh, three of them came from Odysseus, Xanthos, uh, or operated in Odysseus, Xanthos, um, Tsakalov, and uh, Anagnostopoulos, they fought, uh, both fought during the War of Independence. Anna Gnostopoulos certainly did. Uh, Tsakalov died early on and spread the good word of the revolution. They were very well uh, attuned to political affairs in Europe and brought these ideas, the, the ideas of the French Revolution, to Greece. So we have a slow modernization of a very traditional, very conservative traditional society, also segmented in terms of its loyalties, loyalty to the family first and foremost. Hence, the Greek family of today is very strong compared to other European states, certainly. Uh, and uh, a bondage of, or a bond rather, not a bondage, but a bond of common pursuits. Uh, modernity is one of them. Greece has tried and to a great degree has succeeded compared to the Balkan states, at least in, in absorbing modernity from Europe and into becoming the first Balkan member of the European Union and is still in the European Union, which brought great benefits to Greece in terms of uh, modernization and in terms of change. Uh, I should not go on for more. I can go on for hours, but I don't want to do that at your expense. I think you uh, would like perhaps to put forth a few questions. And if I can, I will answer them uh, uh, gladly. So thank you, Mr. Dallas, for the occasion. And uh, you uh, take the floor from here. Okay. Um, thank you for that enlightening lecture, Professor Veremis. Um, we've just put, um, let the audience know that they can submit their questions through the um, chat, chat, chat function. And we've got the first one um, coming in. I'll just read it to you. Um, it's from Ion Donidis. Uh, thank you, Professor Veremis. My question is about this imagined national identity. Could you please expand on it? How is this different from the previous imagined identities you mentioned? For example, the religious. It seems like a necessary but not a sufficient condition for a nation state. Well, uh, the religious identity, the, the identity of the Orthodox Christian, Greek speaking also, because this, the, the two go hand in hand. Uh, Greek speaking and Christian Orthodox are similar concepts in the sense that no Orthodox Greek uh, can be, can be uh, uh, admitted into the church if he doesn't understand what the church is talking about. So the language of the church is Greek uh, and therefore is a prerequisite for anybody who enters that church. Uh, however, there is also, besides the church, there is a non-religious element into nationhood. In fact, a very important non-religious element, which comes from the French Revolution. The French Revolution, as we know, was anything but uh, tied up with the church. Uh, and therefore, there is a, a, a non-religious uh, 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 element which goes into 
the identity of being uh, part of the nation, of the modern nation. The modern nation is a nation that, as I said before, um, justifies the operation of the state. Because what is the state? The state is, 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 a, is an organization is, is, uh, that handles power. Kratos in Greece, in Greek, in ancient Greek, means power, kratos. Uh, therefore, any kratos, any state is synonymous to power. But power without legitimacy is, uh, is not uh, understood as a legitimate state. So here we have the nation, the will of the nation makes the state work as a legitimate source of power. Uh, these are sometimes uh, uh, concepts that evade our attention and it's hard for, for us to understand how of, of, of the development of these concepts. In other words, how they begin as a religious concept and then slowly they become uh, less and less uh, attached to religion until finally they become a totally independent uh, non-religious concept. Uh, so here we are in 10 years of the Greek War of Independence or nine years, depending on how you count it, uh, there is a transformation of society. This does not mean that religion goes away. Religion is always powerful in Greece and remains in that sense uh, strong uh, as a strong element of, of, uh, of um, uh, identity. Uh, even the Communist Party in Greece doesn't re renounce religion. And <laughs> it's interesting because it's part of the tradition, uh, the local tradition of society, uh, but uh, there is a slow uh, distance, distance is put between uh, religion and, and, and the state. So here we are um, of concepts that were not the same from beginning to end. How does one pinpoint the differences? One must follow them as they change which is always very different, very difficult for historians to follow. Sometimes we, we make the mistake of projecting our own identity of today into the past. Not so. Identity is fluid. It's something which keeps certain elements uh, as they are, but also changes. Change is very difficult to depict in history. But it's there and it's there to be studied and to be examined and to find out to what extent we today are synonymous to people of that time. Uh, when Kolokotroni speaks at times, he sounds very relevant. Uh, other occasions, he's not that relevant. Makriyans is never relevant. He's always off the cliff. Uh, but others, uh, not to mention Kapodistrias, who is very relevant, very relevant. Of course, he was an educated person. He was a person who, who knew his times, who was next to the powerful of his days. So he was, he was in line with what was going on in all these transformations that I mentioned. I don't know if all this blabber answers your question, but my uh, admonition is don't expect an easy answer to very difficult concepts, mainly because they are concepts, ever-changing concepts. They change all the time. Hard to pinpoint what they are at one moment in time. Uh, those questions of identity are always difficult because uh, the goalposts are always moving as well. So we've um, got a few more questions um, lined up. A question from um, Helen Gotals. Why did Kapodistrias not use his ideas uh, for Swiss Confederation in Greece? Oh, because, because here we have a very different uh, example of, uh, of a nation. Uh, the Swiss uh, defies 
the term, uh, the Swiss, Swiss identity defies uh, the term nation because it's not one nation, it's at least three, if not four. There's a Germanic element, there is a French element, there is a Italian element and a Romance element, which is a kind of uh, um, Latin speaking Southern European dialect, something like, uh, for instance, uh, in France, it was the uh, Lang Lang Dor uh, Lang Dor. It's Lang Doc, sorry, Lang Doc, uh, the language of uh, Southern France, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Provençal, for instance, it's a Latin form of French, which doesn't exist. It may exist in literary circles but that's the extent of it. So Switzerland is really not one nation, it's four nations into one. And to make this work, you need a very loose system of federation, a confederation. So there's no, there's no equivalent in Greece. Uh, the Greeks, in spite of the fact that they did not know it because this is a, an immobile kind of community, people don't travel. Um, traveling is diff difficult, it's expensive, it's hazardous. Uh, they didn't know who the other guy across the Gulf was. Uh, once they found out, they realized that they were more or less the same. The Stereoeladites or the, the Rumeliotes, as they were called, the Rumeli, and the Peloponnesians, the Moraites, uh, were very similar. They spoke the same language. They went to the same church. They had many things in common in terms of culture. Once they realized that, they also realized that they needed a unitary state, which is the exact opposite to the uh, confederation of the, of the Swiss. Uh, the Greeks were nothing like the Swiss. The Swiss, Swiss were communities of different nations, different ethnic groups, different languages, and different religions. I mean, Christ, Christian, no doubt, but of different varieties. Calvinists, uh, Lutherans, uh, Catholics, you name it. So there were all kinds of people. No comparison to the Greek case. The Greeks are much more similar between themselves uh, than the Swiss ever were, or were, ever will become. So that is why the Greeks, I think, stick to the unitary state they have. And that's why it became possible to make a unitary state in Greece. Okay, we've got a question here from Savas Persanidis. Uh, his question is, what role, if any, did Pontians and other such Greeks outside of modern Greece play in the war of independence? Um, uh, if you could just stick to the first part of the question, what role did Pontians, because if you talk about other Greeks and diaspora, it's a whole lecture in itself. So, uh, yeah, what role do they play uh, in the War of Independence? We know uh, more about, let's say, Cypriots who came to Greece after the um, quelling of the Greek, of the Cypriot War of Independence. Uh, the Cypriot patriarch, Kiprianos, was uh, massacred by the Turks. And so were many people who rose in Cyprus against the war, against the Ottomans. Uh, many left the island, came and fought during the Greek War of Independence. So we know the presence of the Cypriots at the time. We know the presence of the, of the Cretans, who also came to Greece and fought. Uh, and we know the case of uh, uh, people from Smyrna, Smyrni, from across uh, the Aegean, who after the um, massacre of Zmirny in 1821 and 22, uh, left uh, Zmirna and came and fought and died in many occasions in, in Greek uh, uh, uprisings. Uh, we, I personally don't know that much about the Pontian Greeks, uh, which is a much older society, by the way, than the uh, Zmirniot Greeks. Uh, the Smyrna Greeks were very, uh, let's say, 
they came to Smyrna throughout the 17th and 18th century, whereas the Pontian Greeks were a Byzantine, uh, a remnant of Byzantium. They go back into history, uh, the Greeks of Pontus and the um, the uh, empire of Trapezus, a Trapezus to Trapezundus. Uh, these are Pontic Greeks uh, who must have come to the, the Greek War of Independence. I just don't happen to know much about it. I'm sure if you find the historian of the Pontus, uh, we'll be able to explain the history of Pontus uh, during the War of Independence. I know of one person, Paschalis Kitromilidis, for instance, if you're aware of, the, of his works. Uh, he has a Asia Minor background. He's a Cypriot, uh, but his father comes from Asia Minor, his family uh, tradition, so he probably knows much more than I do about the Pontian Greeks. I'm sure they played a role because there's not a single place in the Greek world, so to speak, be it diaspora or communities in, in the Ottoman Empire that did not partake in the Greek War of Independence. The Greek War of Independence was a pan-Hellenic pan uh, uh, movement. Okay, we're just going to continue on the theme of Kapodistas because we've got some questions coming through through our Facebook uh, followers. Um, in your opinion, um, where did Kapodistas go wrong? Well, he, he, his only mistake was to uh, provoke the powerful family of money, the Mavro Michalides, the Black Michaels, <laughs> Mavros Michalides, Mavro Michalides. Uh, they obviously would never, uh, would never. Um, take in the fact that Kapodistrias uh, put the patriarch of the family um, into to, uh, imprisoned, imprisoned uh, um, Petrombes, Peter Bay, Petros. Petrombes means base is a title, is, a, is an Ottoman title, which means the Lord, uh, Peter, Peter the Lord <laughs> of money, uh, they would never, they would never uh, uh, forgive him for having done that. Uh, he was, he was admonished not to do it. But let's face it, Kapodistrias is probably greatest uh, mistake was that he was headstrong. He was a very headstrong individual. He said no. Uh, we, they will have to realize that what we do for Greece is for all the Greeks. We will make no exceptions. Uh, the Maniots, for instance, wanted a, they wanted a, uh, uh, when you import goods, they go through, through customs. customs. They, wanted, they wanted their own custom house. And Kapodistria said, this is ridiculous. There's no way you will ever attain a custom house for money. Uh, Greece will be, there will be one custom system for Greece as there is one government and one of everything. Uh, he was right, of course, in, in, in insisting on that, but he was a bit on the far side when he imprisoned the old man. And let's face it, the Maniots had really fought well during the War of Independence. Mavro Michalis himself, Petrombes, Peter Bay, lost three sons during the War of Independence. One of them, uh, Elias Mavro Michalis, is, is such a good looking man. He's a young man. He was in his 20s, early 20s, I think 21 or 22. If you see his portrait in the Hellenic Historical Museum, he, he's, he looks like uh, an idealist, idealist version of Christ it looks like Jesus Christ, and they called him that. They said, "It's an homer for Sado Christo." Uh, so it's 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 understandable that this father had given a lot to the War of Independence. 
but what can you do? If you have a government that must work, you have to be strict. Kapodistrias was strict, perhaps too much on, on the side of being strict, which cost him his life. Because, you know, the vendetta principle in mind was very strong. If you belittled the, the honor of a family, you were dead. You know, you couldn't survive that. And Kapodistrias knew it. They told him, they said, look, the Maniots will not let you live after what you've done. He says, it doesn't matter. He says, I, I take my orders from above. <laughs> I don't care what the Maniots say. He was a bit headstrong, let's face it. It would have been good for Greece to have Kapodistrias another three or four years so, so that his entire seven years of... Uh, uh, of uh, uh, power would uh, last, but uh, what can you do? I mean, a country also needs heroes and 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 uh, people who suffer for what they believe. So it's a it's a two way street. Yes, he was headstrong, uh, but he was also right in 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 uh, insisting that uh, the state should go on, should move. Let's, let's continue with the question. We're getting some very uh, big questions here, which are lectures themselves. A question from Elias. What was the contribution of the institutional church to the revolution and information of the state? Well, you know, the beginning of the Ottoman uh, rule in Greece, or not the beginning, actually, it was the last, last act to the fall of uh, of Constantinople, um, where Mohammed uh, the Conqueror uh, made uh, Gennadius Holarius head of the Greek Church, uh, the Ecumenico Patriarchi, the Ecumenical Patriarch. And what is Ioan Gennadius Holarius about? He was against the unification of the churches, uh, which was realized in uh, 1439 in uh, Ferrara and um, uh, uh, what's the other place in Italy? Gosh, uh, I forget. Anyway, it will come to me. Uh, he, the emperor, the one before the last, um, Ioannis Paleologos, brother of Constantine Paleologos, who is the last emperor of Byzantium, uh, he tried, he attempted to unify the churches and did so um, with the Pope at the time, Eugene, I, I, I think was his name, uh, in order to create a, 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 a crusade to save Byzantium from the Turks. This never happened, or there was an attempt which failed, uh, but uh, this is what it was behind the attempt to unify the churches. Once the Ottomans came in, they destroyed any prospect of, a, of such a, a collaboration between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church, uh, and by, by, by simply ordain, uh, making um, Yanadius Holarius a, a very convinced anti-unification uh, champion, uh, anthenotikos in Greek, enotiki ke anthenotiki. And from there on, the church had a tradition of despising the Western church. Uh, in fact, there were Greeks who said it's better to have the Turks uh, than to have the Pope as our leader, because at least the Turks will go away one day uh, the Pope ne will never go away. So there was a kind of, of, of very strong feelings against the Western kind of collaboration with the West. Now, as time went by, this became less and less strong. And during the uh, Filiki Eteria's work, it was a collaboration between East and West against the Turks. Uh, therefore, in time, this strong position of the church weakened, but it did not weaken to the point of uh, 
not disliking, let's say, the French Revolution and its heritage and its legacy against the church. So when Gregory V, who was a very conservative man, he did not care for the Enlightenment at all, as opposed to other people of the church who did, who were interested in the Enlightenment and Western Enlightenment. Uh, Gregory V disavowed the revolution. He anathematized, whatever the term is, uh, Alexander, Alexander Ypsilandis, who started the War of Independence in, the, uh, in what is Romania of today. Uh, and in spite of that, the Sultan Mahmoud II um, ordered his death because he considered him as the head of the church, as responsible for anything the non-believers, the Greeks or the Christians did at the time. So he paid uh, uh, his submission with his life. Uh, and there is a, strangely enough, he was re, reinstated as a hero of the Greek War of Independence, um, late 19th century, when his statue was put outside the University of Athens. It's Gregory V on one side and Erigas Ferreras on the other side, two very unlikely uh, friends <laughs> of the uprising. One was an enemy, Gregory V, and uh, whereas Erigas Ferreras, of course, was one of the early uh, apostles of the revolution. Uh, and this is how history works sometimes. Uh, it takes into consideration current feelings and since Gregory uh, post-mortem became a hero of the War of Independence, I don't think he deserved the title. He was a very conservative man. I mean, he had his views. I'm not saying that he, his views were all uh, 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 wrong, but nevertheless, he was against the War of Independence and suddenly he turns out to be a hero of that, uh, uh, unlike his own sympathies. So there you are. The church had a variety of roles, but once Gregory V and several metropolitans were exterminated by the Turks, uh, the rest became part of the War of Independence. And a good example, of course, is Paleon Patron Germanos, uh, Germanos uh, of Patras, Metropoli Metropolitan of Patras, who became very much part of the Greek War of Independence and raised the flag of the revolution in Patras, not in Calabria, that's the mistake. He raised it in Patra, and from there on, many others followed. Uh, thank you for that. We'll just take one final question because this can go on <laughs> till, uh, till our midnight, and, uh, and thank you for the time you've spent so far. Um, Petra Bay uh, want to kill Papa Flesses just before the start of the revolution. Sorry, what was who wanted to kill Papa Flesses? Petro Bay. Ah, Petro Bay. Well, Papa Flesses is a very uh, interesting character in the Greek War of Independence. Uh, he was no doubt a very courageous individual, and his death proves that this is the case. He was not one of the more, let's say, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, reliable character. He had changed views, had changed places in the Greek Civil War. Uh, he was a, ooh, a person full of uh, revolutionary ideas, but not terribly organized as as a revolutionary. Uh, nevertheless, his last act, uh, the fact that he decided to face Ibrahim Pasa in the Peloponnese in Maniaki was uh, a point well taken. He said, we can't run forever. We have to stop and fight. And this is what he did. And of course he died because he only had 300 people to back him up when Ibrahim came in with several thousands. Uh, let's face it, Ibrahim was a formidable 
uh, enemy and a formidable uh, general. Um, whereas Papa Flesses was a very brave man, uh, no doubt. He was willing to give his life for the cause, but he was not, let's say, one of the more effective in terms of uh, uh, outcomes, uh, warriors of the Greek War of Independence. Uh, Professor Lemis, thank you for your time and thank you for agreeing to take part in this little seminar series. Uh, best of luck for the rest of the year and um, any other seminars you have to give. And who knows, maybe one day we will see you in Australia. So, okay. I hope so. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dallas, and thank, uh, thank uh, your audience for me uh, because I can't see them, but I can imagine them. <laughs> community. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, All I want to say that our appreciation is not imagined, it's real, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.